to not care what the other humans think of what you've done, that's actually kind of a very isolating thing. Most people want some validation from other people and they can't, uh, you know, an artist can't help but anticipate what might the other people who will see this like or find pleasing. I mean, I don't think there's anything, I don't, that's not a sellout to me, you know, you're participating in your culture. Welcome to The Bold Brush Show, where we believe that fortune favors the bold brush. My name is Laura Arango bayer and I'm your host. For those of you who are new to the podcast, we are a podcast that covers art marketing techniques and all sorts of business tips specifically to help artists learn to better sell their work. We interview artists at all stages of their careers, as well as others who are in careers tied to the art world in order to hear their advice and insights. Today, we sat down with James Crandall, an artist with a deep love of capturing candid moments in time that reflect everyday life while also focusing on interesting plays of life. In this episode, we talked about how his past as an illustrator helped him in certain aspects when he decided to pursue representational painting, how the intention with which you paint determines the outcome, and the differences between painting for yourself and painting for the market. Finally, we discuss his YouTube channel, the pros and cons of social media, his lovely paintings of Luca, and the reality of being a painter or a craftsperson in a time when everything is perpetually changing faster and faster because of the internet. Welcome, James, to the Bold Brush Show. How are you today? I'm good, thank you, Laura. Of course, yeah. Um, I am very excited to talk to you because we were just chatting before the interview and we have a lot of things that we share in common. Um, of course, our love for the ancient Greek Stoic philosophy. But before we dive into all of that and how it you know, comes into your work and maybe some of the themes that you like to explore, uh, do you mind giving us a little bit of background about who you are and what you do? Well, it's uh, pretty simple. I was an illustrator in Los Angeles um, from about 1980 until about uh, 2006. And I worked in the advertising industry as a concept artist. Um, so I'd be drawing things out of my head or from reference photographs for clients like uh, Lexus or Paramount Studios or something. So it, it wasn't things that the public would see. It was, they were pictures that were taken to meetings for people to discuss concepts. Oh. And then about 2006, uh, I kind of got burned out and was tired of city life. And so my wife and I moved uh, to Northern California to the country. And I gradually got out of advertising and started uh, painting full time. Wow, nice. Um, that's wow. You know, it's very interesting that I I keep coming across really great illustrators who become really great realist painters, and I it, I find it so interesting. I don't know if it's because illustration has something about it that is just that helps simplify, you know, something in a beautiful way, or it helps with the I guess the composition or the color understanding of things in a way that just being trained in academia just doesn't really reach that point. Um, so I'm always fascinated when I see illustrators who become representational painters for that reason, because they, they're mm -hmm. amazing. <laughs> and there's a lot of illustrators who are uh, making paintings now. Yes. Because there's, yeah. le there's, there's less traditional illustration work, frankly. Very true. Yeah. Um, and it's still recognizable, too, of course, because, you know, like Norman Rockwell, for example, he's very like he's definitely illustrative, but it's also representational at the same time. So that's like a good example of like that in between space. But I feel like it's so easy for illustrators to go in both directions, you know, very, you know, in a way that is a lot harder if you just train in one side, like the representational side, and then you try to go into illustration. I feel like that's a lot more challenging. Um, yeah, I don't know anyone who's done that. Oh, yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we can have someone on the show in the future who has um yeah. but yeah yeah um so speaking of though um obviously you know illustration and and painting representationally they have that key element of you know being an artist right so i wanted to know did the path of the artist choose you or did you choose the path of the artist uh, i i think i chose it i didn't feel obliged to do it and uh 
I did well in school and in liberal arts college, and uh, it just it just seemed to me that uh, of all the things I was reasonably good at, I was particularly good at making pictures, and I also liked it, and it seemed like it would be more fun, and that was sort of true and sort of not, but uh, so <laughs> that's the way I went. Oh, interesting. So I eventually went to a a professional art school called Art Center College of Design, um, mm. which still exists and is actually much larger. But at the time, it was only about a thousand students. Wow. And the theme of the school was uh, to train us to work in industry. Um, so there were car designers, there were filmmakers, there were photographers, there were product designers, um, and there were illustrators. And, I, and at the time, we were looking forward to going out in the world and um, doing illustrations for print magazines or album covers or movie posters, um, most of which barely exist anymore, of course. Yeah. Um, and I did some of that, but mostly I got involved in Los Angeles with this conceptual art thing because it was a much more regular gig and, mm -hmm. uh, and it required less... Um, effort on my part in marketing, I, I just sort of put myself out there and then people called me. Right, right. Would that be kind of like industrial design? You know, how, how they make like a, a sort of like a design, say for a car that doesn't exist and hasn't really been engineered yet, but you know, that in that sort of realm? Well, in my case, no. Uh, the car is already designed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the car company has already, and I worked, I did a lot for car um, accounts, mm -hmm. but um you know, Lexus would hire an ad agency and they would come up for ideas for print and for um, for video. And they would hire me to come in and sort of make their ideas uh, visible. Okay. And so they would take my storyboards or my mock-ups of what the ad would look like to meetings mm -hmm. and, you know, ask the client, can we spend a million dollars making this TV commercial or will you spend... You know, well, can we go hire a photographer to make this print ad? Right. So my work is it had to be done very quickly and with what, however I could manage to put together the image. Right. Uh, so it was very hectic, mm -hmm. a lot of deadlines. Sometimes I worked at home, but often I worked right in their office. Interesting. Wow. But it, Would you say? It, it was interesting. Yeah. Would you say that that time pressure, you know, had an effect in, you know, painting, for example, like Alla Prima for you, like now as an artist, or has that affected you at all? Oh, I'm sure it has. Um, I, I don't seem to, um, it, it's good and bad. I, mm. I work very quickly, or I can work very quickly. Um, I'm used to, because I was used to starting a thing, doing the most important aspects first, because I never knew when a when a guy in a suit and tie was just going to come in the room and take it away from me. Mm. Um, on the other hand, I didn't, I didn't do a lot of things that were very finished. So I didn't mm. have those experiences, but I will say that now I have no trouble starting a thing. I have no trouble sticking to it. I have no trouble coming back to it. <laughs> None of that phases me. If anything, I have trouble stopping. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, and I, I yeah, I, I think that, that about says it. Yeah. And, and the fact that I had, I was just drawing all day, every day when I was at work. And yeah. um, that's just a ton of practice. It is. It is. And yeah. um, I don't know that there's any substitute for that. No. Um, I was drawing yeah. more probably than I did when I was in art school, you know, mm -hmm. spending more hours drawing. Yeah. And I would say that that was probably very beneficial. It's really interesting because I, I always hear this, uh, this advice, you know, from, from people who uh, aren't artists or are artists who have had a day job that was not art related because they tell you, oh, you shouldn't have an art related day job because then you're just going to burn yourself out and you won't want to work on your work. But I, I think it depends a lot on the work itself because I interviewed a few months ago, I interviewed someone who worked as an illustrator as well for a children's cartoon. 
Um, and he mentioned how that helped him in his own work because of the same thing you just said of having extra time, extra practice, extra, you know, being in front of the canvas and, and problem solving, you know, for all of this time, I think it it's very beneficial. Um, it's like the whole, uh, gosh, what's his name? Uh, the, the 10,000 hours, uh, theory that, uh, some yeah. people like to posit, uh, which I'm 50, 50 on that theory, but, <laughs> but I think it can, it can be true. Um, I think you could also spend $10,000 repeating the same thing and not making any progress too. Exactly. So it's, it's kind of good from an illustrator point of view. I was not painting things. I was not making images of things that I chose. They were all assignments and they came mm -hmm. out of left field. Right. And so I couldn't just paint the same thing successfully over and over again, you know, because they were always throwing me curveballs. Huh? That's even better. <laughs> Before I forget, the downside is when I was doing that sort of work, um, my brain sort of started functioning as a, kind of like a three-dimensional program in a computer where I was very good at visualizing anything from any angle and then drawing it. Um, that's been a little bit of a handicap as I became a painter because my approach to painting is to Re record the shapes and colors that I'm looking at without thinking of them as objects, mm. which is kind of a different place to be. Yeah. And so my brain switches back and forth those things, and sometimes it's kind of irritating. Does that yeah, make any yeah. sense? It does. Yeah, it does. It's, you know, the whole theory of, you know, finding shapes uh, and simplifying them or finding like color shapes uh, and, you know, putting those on the canvas. It, it ha That's a very, yeah, it's a very 2D sort of uh, way of conceptualizing reality compared to, you know, this person has dimension or, or this thing has dimension. It's yeah. very different. Um, and of course the 2D, I guess the 2D conceptualizing helps a lot, especially with, you know, placing for like a la prima, you know, you put one thing, then the next thing, the next thing and shapes. It, it, I think it helps simplify it a lot. Um, so I can, I can understand that. <laughs> you could look at it in, the, in terms of, um, you know, drawing a figure or a face, mm -hmm. you could know a lot about anatomy mm -hmm. and come at it that way, trying to make yeah. the, the picture agree with what you know to be true, or you could come at it like a camera does, knows nothing about anatomy, simply mm -hmm. records the shapes and the values. Right. Yeah, there's different levels. <laughs> yeah. There's different, I, I, I guess I would also call it like levels of, um, what would it be? Like, I want to say quality levels, but resolution levels, you know, like how in depth do you want to get into your subject? Um, yeah, that's fascinating. That's a very interesting drawback because um, you would think it would be a useful drawback <laughs> and not a natural. Well, but, I, but I think a lot of I. I've done a few workshops and taught a little bit, and I found a, a lot of people struggle with painting what they see because they're trying to help things along by interjecting what they think they know about the object. Uh -huh. Like they yes. think they know what color it should be, or they think they know what shape it should be, and they, if they're unconsciously forcing it into that instead of looking. Very true. Yes, there's the whole issue of, and I had another guest recently, and she mentioned like when you get into the realm of sky is blue, clouds are white. That's that's where you start losing. You need to forget that. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. almost like you have that's to catch to those nuances. It is, it is because so much of our our mental capacity in our brain, you know, our brain puts a pause on being able to, you know, like you can't just sit in a room and take in absolutely everything at the same time because you would go crazy. So your brain has to like make things a little easier for you to digest. Um, right. And and being an artist, you have to go against that in a lot of ways. Uh -huh. We have to actually consciously observe something with a little bit of, you know, prior knowledge, but at the same time, allowing yourself to really see. <laughs> so it's such a difficult balance uh, to keep. It is hard, I think, uh, especially for adults to um, to get hold of that idea when they're trying to get better. Yeah, uh, yeah, or even on. just trying to learn. Uh, yeah, you know, maybe after retirement, which I've met a lot of people who, after retirement, they start painting, and uh, it's it's a can of worms for a lot of them, and uh, I can imagine. 
It's like it is, and also, you know, we in America, at least, we grew up in sort of a cartoon culture um, mm. with cartoon books and, and um, comic books. And um, a lot of people think of art in terms of making an outline of things and then mm-hmm. filling them in with color. And uh, that's sort of really kind of antithetical to, to actual realism. Yeah, it is. Oh. People, th- people think that having a lot of edges and a lot of borders will make a thing look more real when it's, actually it's the opposite. The more edges you can lose, the more real it's going to feel because that's reality. Exactly. Yeah, there are no, no edges in reality that are linear no. per se. It's all, you know, it's three-dimensional. Right. There's no lines. Um, so many things to learn and to unlearn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so much of painting is unlearning. Um, and I think it's the biggest understatement, uh, especially when you go to art school. It's like you realize you, you've never really looked at someone's face <laughs> the way that you do as an artist. You know, you, you see everything. Um, yes, I saw you were uh, uh, trained at some point as, an, as sort of an academy painter or I guess yes. what they call an atelier painter now mm-hmm. and so probably you had to sit right in front of somebody's face and measure their every little part of their face and cock yeah. it and yeah. yeah yeah we did that in my art school too but only not for a long time <laughs> mm. yeah no it, it's a lot it can be really intimidating um at one of the schools we were uh, so far away from the model um that I ha- we had these binoculars, little binoculars, to look at the person's face. And uh, it, I think that is the most invasive invasive thing ever. But at the same time, you know, you really notice what you, you've never noticed before. And that is that pretty much everyone looks the same <laughs> to some extent, which is so funny. Um, well, I, but, it, but it's also, it was, for me, it was revealing those, those sessions. And, and I think what they did in, in my classes was they just hired so many models that there was a person for every three artists and we sat very close. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. But what I learned was, you know, we, we were admitted to this art school, so we all had some skills, but everybody's result was pretty much fine. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody's yeah. turned out. You, if you followed the system, it worked. Mm-hmm. And then there was some comfort in that. Yeah. If you measure and make the shapes, and really pay attention, you will get the result. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Did you have to use a specific system at, at your illustration school? Uh, it was just, what do they call it? Site size, where ah, just okay. ha- an extended arm measuring right. with, with your yeah. pencil. Yeah, because yeah, I know some illustration schools, they'll use uh, like the, uh, what's it? There's, I forget the name of the, the Riley method, I think it is, but they, you know, they have the, the head and they drew, like they, divide it and stuff so it's a very different way of I'm kind of skeptical about that although I grew up on, on manuals that you know said Talk you know a it. third a third a third and this one third two thirds and all that mm-hmm. <clears throat> which is fine as long as you're drawing someone that's looking directly at you but the minute they turn your head it sort of all goes out the window so what's the point yeah <laughs> yeah um yeah I mean and it's also like not everyone has the same exact proportions um well, that's like true. we all kind of approximate to some extent, but I don't think everyone perfectly fits into, you know, the exact manual well, version. <laughs> some someone told me I think, and I think it was one of my peers who had been a caricature artist at a at an amusement park before we all went to school, and he said, if you can get this triangle right, right in here, yeah. it doesn't matter what else you do; it'll still be a likeness. Oh my God, that's a yeah. great point. That's a great point. I think that's um, mostly true. Yeah. I mean, likeness is, is something else that I think is, you know, you can get away with so many things and still achieve likeness, you know? Um, but <laughs> that's a whole other can of worms. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, since you have the perspective, you know, of, of an illustrator and you might have started for one particular reason, and now that you're a representational artist, I wanted to know what themes you explore now as a representational artist um, and what messages you like to explore in your work? Yeah, I, d- I don't have a message. Uh, uh, 
in my own mind, I'm more interested in, in technique and sort of the formalities of making a good picture. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not that committed to any subject matter and I don't really have anything profound to say. Um, I'll tell you, I'm a big fan of street photography. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was in high school, I was actually more of a photographer than, than, a, than an artist, than a painter. And um, I like things that are sort of captured uh, serendipitously and mm -hmm. then just have a charm or a feeling to them that you wouldn't have thought to construct, but just happened. And I, and I mm -hmm. like things like that. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, it's like the, the candid picture snapshot of uh, of day to day life as a human being or as whatever you're trying to capture. That's yeah. Nice. So th things that are uh, I, I respect people that do things that are posed and staged and set ups and and all that. Um, uh, but I've never done much of that for my own work. Um, mm -hmm. And and maybe it comes because I don't. I'm 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 never really um, confident of how it is I should make a composition. I sort of do it by feel. And it's for me, and especially going through advertising, it's much more easily for me to take a photograph or an existing image and say, well, that's a good image. This is where it should be cropped. <laughs> oh. And that's, that's mostly my system. Yeah, you know, there is still something I, I mean, I could even say that your lack of message in, in your work means that the work itself could be a message just on its own. You know, this is life on Earth and uh, it is it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is, which doesn't make a very good artist statement, I found. Uh, <laughs> it's not what really people are looking for. Yeah, um, but I mean, these but... days, artist statements, you know, the, no one really reads those anymore, I think. <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, so... I think it's fine. Uh, which brings up another point. I don't really think the people that buy my paintings care about me. I, I don't think I don't think they care about my life or my life as an artist. They just mm -hmm. want the picture. And I don't expect them to care about me or my message. You know, that's think, that's fine too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um I like I like for them to think it's well done and that they get, you know, yes. give some pleasure, but they don't need to uh you know, consider what drove me to do it. I don't, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do you find that um, you've reached that point? I guess, actually, no, I want to, why, why have you maybe reached that point with your work of, of having that perspective? Well, maybe it extends from being an illustrator. I just, uh, mm -hmm. I try to satisfy myself in the mm -hmm. art making while I'm making something that someone else will like. Uh, because when you're an illustrator, uh, you don't dictate what, what you're painting. You might add something to the solution or inject your, some of your own ideas, but uh, the client doesn't really wanna be surprised by some radical departure you've made. They want what they want. And you could, it's analogous really, I think to the history of art. I mean, Michelangelo, gets a commission to do the ceiling, he's not free to do what he wants. He's told what has to be up there. Mm -hmm. uh, and when Sargent, you know, takes money for a, a, a portrait, he's meant not to convey reality even, but to make the sitter look good and important. And so mm -hmm. he's really an illustrator too. Yeah. When he's doing that work. When he's on vacation and doing what he wants, he can stop calling himself, you can stop calling him an illustrator, but he's the same artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting point to make. Yeah, it's like, who are you when you don't paint for anyone but yourself? You know, it's like, it's very different. It's like the two faces of, uh, I guess, of, of sales in a way. Like if you want to, if you want to be an artist who sells their work, versus an artist who is not swayed by any market and just wants to, you know, do it for the heck, heck of it. <laughs> and I you think know? that the latter person is a rare bird in, indeed to, to not care what the other humans think of what you've done. That's actually kind of a very isolating thing. Most people 
want some validation from other people mm -hmm. and they can't, uh, you know, an artist can't help but anticipate what might the other people who will see this like or find pleasing. I mean, I don't think there's anything, I don't, that's not a sellout to me, you mm -hmm. know, you're participating in your culture. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't think there's any, any quote unquote bad or good approach, right? Because in the end, even if you do paint for a market or you don't, you know, you're still doing it primarily because you love it, right? Like that's, I mean, at least that's what most of us uh, do it for. We do it because like you said in the beginning, it's fun. Um, yeah. I can I mean, I, do whatever yeah. I want. <laughs> I have my preferences for subject matter, but, but yes. um, it's like a Venn diagram, you know, things I'd like to paint things people might buy there's an overlap but it's yeah. not complete of you course. know because a lot of what i might do or do do is completely unpalatable to people you know it it's too much about uh, decay or sadness or and who am i going to sell that to I, I i but i but sometimes i just feel like i i need to get that out of my system well yeah or i just i just find sort of you know i might just find kind of a depressing image uh intriguing and that's what i want to do oh my gosh you know i admit i have a lot of ideas but they're all very very either gruesome or depressing and i'm you know there's a there's a skull this. behind you <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh you are right i do have a skull behind me <laughs> when i was in college or around that time and right after i got out i did etchings uh, mm -hmm. And I have an etching press. I did etchings of graves. Interesting. Not, not fleshy body graves, but skeletons in graves. I just mm -hmm. found that, you know, archaeological sites. So yeah. I was working from archaeological photos. I found that completely fascinating and fun to draw. Nobody wants them. <laughs> For, nobody wants to hang that in their house because they would be forever explaining why do you have a picture of a skeleton in a grave on your wall? I don't get that. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, it's so funny how death is so taboo, you know, um, just, you know, from my, my, my opinion over here, um, it is one of the most natural things out there. And I understand that maybe people don't, don't find it, you know, palatable to think about death every day, but I tell you, you know, I think about it every day. <laughs> Yeah, so, I sure do. Yeah, you know it's well. An I don't think it was all. I don't think it was always taboo. I mean, you have the no. You know the memento mori paintings that where a person would be holding a skull or contemplating a skull or a yeah. still life with that kind of objects, and mm -hmm. of course that went along with religion too, right? Probably at the yeah. time, but it was the idea that uh, you know don't be too materialistic, don't be too proud, don't be too vain. Um, you're gonna die. And I think there was a time, especially when people didn't live as long, mm -hmm. when um, that would be something you'd have in your home to remind you yeah. that, you, you know, your time was short and you weren't that important. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's not even a gloomy thing, to be honest. You know, I, I think it's, I know it can be very sad, obviously, to lose someone um, and to, you know, not know what really happens next. It's terrifying. So I totally get it. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting how there are subjects as artists that are almost like untouchable for the market, um, unless you find some creepy person out there who maybe exists who would love to have that on their wall. Um, you know, maybe it's one in a one in a million out there. But yeah, it's interesting that if you could paint anything you wanted, you know, without caring about anything in the world, that I feel like that says a lot about the things that you really care about in life, you know, and, and the things that you personally resonate with, you know? Not to say that, you know, people can't resonate with things that are marketable, but it, it's a very big difference sometimes. I, I always envy people who just naturally want to paint cheerful things, you know, because I think what, a, what an incredible advantage in the market to just like to paint cheerful things. And, yeah. and want to do nothing else. And what a boon that is. <laughs> it is. It is a great boon. 
<laughs> Whereas, oh you know, it, you know, the few times I painted flowers, and I can paint flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not practiced at it, but I, you know, it'll it'll look like a flower. But the whole time I'm thinking, this really isn't me <laughs> to be doing this. Yeah, yeah, it feels it feels a little bit unless wrong. there's a unless there's flowers and they're dead and there's a skull there, that would be me. You see. There you go. There you go. <clears throat> Oh, that's so fascinating. Um, uh, I did want to know, by the way, uh, since we're we're talking about you know the work that you want versus the work that you had maybe to do, I was curious to know when was the moment when you were at your day job and you said, "I can't take this anymore. I'm gonna just do this on my own." It was gradual, um, and it, part of it was uh, well, part of it was the pressure, but but other part of it was. Uh, I was no longer working in traditional media. Mm. Um, as advertising agencies computerized and they were laying out everything and designing everything on computers themselves, they really wanted a digital product for me. And at first it meant scanning drawings, then it meant scanning drawings and coloring them in the computer. And, and eventually I just gave in and I said, well, I'm just going to do the entire thing on a graphics tablet. And uh, towards the end, it was, I, I felt like I was kind of just making photo collages that I was painting over. Mm -hmm. um, so it, at first it was kind of fun, uh, but then it got to be kind of a bore mm -hmm. and I wasn't going back. <laughs> um, and then the, I, I even got into 3D programs. I, you know, it was just a matter of, I need to, I need to compete, and to compete, I have to be the fastest person that makes car images in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. or they might stop calling. Right. So. Oof. I can only imagine. I mean, it's so competitive there, too, for, for jobs like that. So. Well, it is, I, oh. but you can't fault them. I mean, um, yeah. it used to be, you know, there'd be, a, you know, if there was a campaign in progress, there might be a, 10 artists in a room trying to produce the uh, presentation uh, and towards the end, a person could do it by themselves mm -hmm. or with, or two people could because the computer just accelerated everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's crazy. Which is a loss of jobs, if you think yes. about it, but, but there's nothing it, you yeah. can do about that. Uh, no. <laughs> oh man. And, you know, and the, the interesting thing is the art directors would even say, you know, we'd like the look of the hand-drawn work better, but um, nobody else cares. The digital work mm. is good enough for the purpose. Right. And we can't afford to pay you to do it by hand. Right, because <clears throat> it's extra hours. Um, yeah. And, of course, you know, profits. Profits are king. Uh, so... Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, but at least, you know, you disentangled yourself from that. Um, what was the transition like for you from like day job to full time artist? Were you able to jump right in or did you have it as like a backup? I, I, had, I was already uh, painting on the side and mm -hmm. I had a, one gallery. And um, as I was getting out of the business, I added some galleries. But moving away from Los Angeles sort of created the change. Mm -hmm. um, I just wasn't part of the politics of the office anymore, and so I wasn't getting as much work, and I didn't care anymore about getting work, and I just spent more and more time making my own pictures. So that's how that happened. It took about five years for it to go away completely, but... Mm -hmm. Wow. Five years I is pretty I, good. Yeah, it slowed to a dribble, and then it was gone, and I said good riddance. And... Yeah. Oh my gosh. And and I'm sure you'd never he'd never turn back anyway. <laughs> no, it was too late. And and also I was getting older and advertising is a very youth driven thing. Mm -hmm. In the sense of um if you're designing advertising, um there's very few people under forty in a in a creative department. And 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 they all, they all know the current music, they know the current fashions, they know the current movies, they know the current special effects. Right. And I was really losing touch with all that anyway. Yeah. 
that's life. You know, yeah, yeah it, it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, but that sucks. Um, but yeah, I'm glad at least you know you still wound up doing something you enjoy. Yeah. And it made and it made uh, it made young art directors uncomfortable to be working with me because it was weird for them. Right, right. right. Especially oh. in person. Yeah. To have the older, experienced guy under their command, it was weird mm-hmm. for everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, so I can imagine. Wow, fascinating. And and also, I would you know, I got very cynical because the young <laughs> art directors would come with a new idea. And I'd heard it 10 times before in my career. And right. I just could not get enthusiastic about it because it wasn't new to me. You know, that's you the know, other the, interesting The thing. idea that a car would drive down the street and people would think it was so beautiful that they turned and looked and were amazed. <laughs> that's as old as the hills. But every time a new art director come, came up with it, he thought he thought it up for the first time. It was very enthusiastic. <laughs> That's actually kind of endearing. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Oh, man. But it's I mean, okay I feel like because, yeah. It's, it, okay. it's, it's, yeah, it's like the equivalent of, you know, someone painting an apple, I guess, and being like, this is a still live. It's like, yeah, it's, or like apple and grapes in a bowl, you know, it's been done. Um, doesn't mean with it can't little, be done again. With a little but. Chinese statue? Oh, yeah. I'm stepping <laughs> on some toes there. <laughs> man but there's nothing wrong with it right i mean there's also the fact that you know there's nothing new under the sun and and so therefore there's no pressure to just do it again um yeah. there's still well, there joy could in be. it there, there could be i mean uh what you know sometimes i've seen um fine artists get successful at a certain subject matter mm-hmm. and then get bored with it before their con- customers did and that's yeah. the problem it is yeah because he's saying, I don't want to do that same thing again. And they're saying, uh, we're not really interested in other things that you do. Uh-huh. And that's the other issue of painting for the market. Um, it's uh, You will most likely have a popular painting that everyone's going to ask for. And you're going to get sick and tired of it in five minutes. I, and I've heard that from multiple painters who have, who have been on the on the podcast. But that's Nelson's not a new, that's not a new thing. I mean, yeah. um, Monet may have started his haystacks as a fun exercise <laughs> and been excited with before, but I think history shows that the reason he made so many is because they were selling, uh, and he, he he needed the money, so he made more. You know, that's how it and is. And there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing no. wrong with that. No, there's nothing. And he, wrong. I'm sure you know he you you get to, I I personally I don't mind. Uh, doing a painting or a similar painting again because in my mind I'm having a different experience and I'm trying different things and the client may not even realize it but but I'm working off of past experience and I have a, a different approach in mind it's pretty mm-hmm. subtle and and it won't bother them so. right yeah because they still get what they wanted anyway um yeah I, yeah. My favorite thing to do is for people to find a little painting that I did as a study and say, oh, gee, I wish that were really big. And I'd say, I can do that. I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, you know, I, I think you can work around those things in, in ways that are, you know, more pleasurable for, for you, right? Like, um, I think, I mean, I did hear one of my guests, she said, Oh yeah, if I want to make some money, I just paint a few extra of this type of painting that I know will sell, and that'll give me time to be able to work on the stuff I actually enjoy. So there's a way of you know balancing it out. You know, it's not and it's and not there's nothing crappy. wrong with that. But I, I would yeah. point out that that is not different from what an illustrator does. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, I did the illustration so that later I could paint what I wanted to paint. Exactly. Exactly. And you got practice out of it too, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At Bold Brush, we inspire artists to inspire the world because creating art creates magic. And the world is currently in desperate need of magic. Bold Brush provides artists with free art marketing, creativity, and business ideas and information. This show is an example. We also offer written resources, articles, and a free monthly art contest open to all visual artists. We believe that fortune favors the bold brush. And if you believe that too, 
sign up completely free at boldbrushshow.com. That's B-O-L-D-B-R-U-S-H show.com. The Bold Brush Show is sponsored by Faso. Now more than ever, it's crucial to have a website when you're an artist, especially if you want to be a professional in your career. Thankfully, with our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast, you can make that come true and also get over 50% off your first year on your artist website. Yes, that's basically the price of 12 lattes in one year, which I think is a really great deal considering that you get sleek and beautiful website templates that are also mobile friendly, e-commerce, print on demand in certain countries, as well as access to our marketing center that has our brand new art marketing calendar. And the art marketing calendar is something that you won't get with our competitor. The art marketing calendar gives you day-by-day, step-by-step guides on what you should be doing today, right now, in order to get your artwork out there and seen by the right eyes so that you can make more sales this year. So if you want to change your life and actually meet your sales goal this year, then start now by going to our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast. That's F-A-S-O dot com forward slash podcast. Yeah. Um, speaking of, do you have any advice for someone who wants to, you know, become a full-time artist? Yeah, somehow I knew you would ask me that. And I don't. <laughs> I don't have any advice. <laughs> and the reason is I've never made a living as a painter of paintings. Um <laughs> There may have been one or two years where I sold enough. You could have called it a modest living. Mm-hmm. But mostly I live off, uh, you know, retirement income and savings from when I was an illustrator. Mm-hmm. And my income as a painting and painter is just supplemental. Right. I don't know. <clears throat> I know some painters who paint full time and, and make a living from it. But I think they're a lot more rare than people imagine. I think, you know, a lot of people have spouses that produce most of the income in the family or a large part of it. Or, um, you know, they have family money or uh, something that lets them do what is really a very generally unprofitable thing, Mm -hmm. uh, making pictures. Yeah, I mean, artists... I mean, an exception I can think of is someone who I know who's a, who, uh, well, I won't name him, but he's one of my classmates, one of my good friends, and uh, he did illustration when we got out in, in another state, and he gradually got into the portrait painting business. Mm-hmm. And I know from talking to him, he doesn't want to do that anymore. He would rather do other things. But he still does a lot of that to pay bills, and he and he he does a collection of things. You know, he does some teaching, and he he paints mm-hmm. some things for galleries. Um, but he hasn't been able to abandon the portrait painting because it pays so well. And he's got kids, and I don't. Yeah, you know, I feel like every artist. I've seen who, who makes a living from their work usually supplements it in you know in all the ways that you've mentioned you know teaching or galleries or online or workshops you know they'll do various things because you know it's it's really hard and I, I mentioned this also in previous episodes where it's hard when you're both the you know the 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 production line right you're mm-hmm. like the person on the production line and then you're also the one that packs it up and and you know puts it out there it's really hard um, especially if you're a slow painter, right? So, like, for example, like, Odd Nerdrum, he makes maybe six paintings a year, and that's a lot for him because they're massive paintings. Um, but, of course, he he has his collectors from, like, before. So he has ways of supplementing his income. He has his books. He has, you know, he teaches... I, I don't know if he teaches workshops anymore now, but he also used to do workshops. He used to, you know, diversify income, right? So it's... Uh, yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> Not for the and it's always, heart. it's always changing, isn't it? Um, yes. It I know is. a couple of uh, working artists who uh, have withdrawn from all brick and mortar galleries mm-hmm. because they mm-hmm. simply have a small group of uh, you know wealthy collectors who they can depend on. Right. And uh, that is that is the core of their business, keeping those people happy. And giving them mm-hmm. what they want, and they don't really need to look elsewhere for income 
or you know they might teach but they don't need to mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and then i have other people who sell a little teach a lot it it just depends yeah you know? yeah it's a it's a career with no rules really that's what makes it so challenging and, and it's one of the reasons we have this podcast too is to show how how many different paths there are and every person's path is just entirely different sometimes but it's still good to hear you know how someone has been able to navigate through you know their life and the way that they've been able to do things because sure there i mean everyone's path is different but there might be some similarities right or some some ideas right like for example teaching that in general if someone's good at teaching it's it's good to teach um pass on the knowledge and then you also get paid for it that's really great um mm. so it's uh it's good to know <laughs> also I, I see a lot of artists especially women who are so good at socializing and have such mm -hmm. great personalities that um they sell tons of workshops and lessons and some of their paintings and it's not that they're the necessarily the very best technical painters but they have a they have a different package mm -hmm. and you know sometimes it's just uh having people that want to support you mm -hmm. who can afford to help you out and yeah there, there's there really nothing of... nothing new apart from you know apart from the destruction of the culture from by the internet yeah, you know, I was about to ask you about the internet. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, how, how, you know, oh man, how do you find or how do you feel actually about social media and, you know, and YouTube? Because you have a YouTube channel. Um, how do you feel about these social media platforms uh, in terms of, you know, these using them as tools, right, for artists? Yeah, I, well, I participate uh, because it's not difficult to participate. Um, I had, you know, Facebook and Instagram accounts early on. And I think um, before there was so much traffic, I managed to get a lot of followers. But that's almost a function of my timing more than it is uh, what I post, if that makes any sense. So that because I just got in early and when there were less painters on the internet, I have a lot of followers. Um, but, you know, the logarithms change, and now I find that even though I've got many thousands of followers, that doesn't mean they're going to see my posts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, I would post something, and within a couple minutes, I'd, I'd have hundreds of hits. That just can't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm competing with uh, videos of talking dogs and dancing girls, and uh, those are frankly more appealing than any of my paintings, so I don't know how to compete. And I, you mentioned my YouTube channel. I, I do have that, um, but it's funny. I, I I do different kinds of videos. I uh, I do some painting and some painting instruction and some drawing instruction. And they're they sort of the they're either showing my process mostly without comment or giving little tips. But you know what gets the most hits on my channel are the. Um, the videos about um, making panels and framing, because I do my own framing. Oh, yeah, I did see so that. People are going to YouTube to figure out how to do something for themselves, and that's very often what they're what they're there for, <laughs> um, rather than. It, but the but the people who are looking for how to paint videos, I think, is fairly small. Um, but then I, you know, I haven't been beaten the bushes and I, and I don't, I don't really attack it the way a younger person might need to, to build yeah. a career. It's not that important. Yeah. Actually, one of my top videos was when I decided to change the battery in my BMW motorcycle and, and show how it's done. I get hits from all over the world and people thanking me for showing how that's done. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's the trick with YouTube. You know, YouTube is actually um, surprisingly actually the the best the best part of YouTube is the how to side because oh. you'll usually get people um, every so often always looking for the same exact thing. 
Um, and I did see, I think you, your YouTube channel is actually monetized. So you actually get a little bit of profit from there too. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, uh, it's, it's nice. If you could say it, it pays for my annual paint, uh, maybe a little more than that. Paint, well, paint and go. brushes. How about that? That's great. Uh, Cause I destroy a lot of brushes, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I enjoy doing it, you know, mm -hmm. because I was a storyboard artist and was involved in making a commercials. I sort of think in in sort of a storyboard kind of way. Mm -hmm. So I love editing and I, you know, I enjoy the cameras and the, and the audio and all that stuff, too. So. Yeah. Oh, that's sweet, though. Um, that's great. You actually I think I saw you have like a good few thousand subscribers on YouTube. So I think I think you're doing great. Yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um, do you have any any uh final advice? Uh I guess for anyone out there who's maybe choosing their career path. Maybe they want to be an artist, maybe they don't. <laughs> uh it's not gonna be easy. Um and it's probably going to be different in ten or twenty years than it is now. <clears throat> I think if we're honest with ourselves, um there's more and more people who want to make art and try to sell art, but the proportionally the number of customers is probably going to shrink hmm. um, for cultural reasons, because you're competing with uh, everything that appears on an iPad or a video monitor. And I don't see younger people adopting the tradition of hanging paintings in their homes. Mm -hmm. My big paintings already have to cost more than an LED screen of the same size mm -hmm. by a large margin. Are kids going to do that? Are they going to say, well, we could cover this wall with a, a painting that never changes or a really big screen that always changes? <laughs> I don't know how to compete with that. A good point. We will just, I think we will just have to wait and see. I do think I, my, and I'm just guessing, but I would guess that um, painting will, will follow the track kind of of horses. I, I live in a kind of a horse community out here in the country and a lot of people mm -hmm. have horses. Mm -hmm. If you think about horses in the middle of the 19th century, they were essential. They did most of the hard work. They did most of the transportation. Everybody had to know about them. There were a whole industry to take care of them and feed them and shoe them and make saddles for them and buggy whips and carriages and all that. And that went away in a fairly short time because of a different technology. But there are still horses because there's a core of people who just like horses and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like being around horses and like riding horses. And that nut, that, that core is probably stable. Yeah. And, and I kind of think the same thing will happen with paintings. It's like, it'll, the people who care about it will be a smaller and smaller per, per percentage of the population, but they will care, care very deeply and it will never quite die. I hope that's not too pessimistic, but that's kind of <laughs> what I believe is going to happen. You know, it's, it's interesting. It is interesting. You know, we they, are definitely in a strange time. Attendance is down at art, at art galleries. Uh, yeah. Not just commercial ones, but, uh, you know, Metropolitan or any, mm -hmm. any museum in, you made. And COVID was a big hit to it. Yes. But it's never really recovered, and I'm, I'm not... Sure, it will. It's the same with, uh, you know, live theater or even movie theaters. Um, it was a great thing, but it, it may have I, it's probably seen its peak. So sad because I love I love movie theaters and I, I love the actual theater. I, I actually uh, I volunteered at the opera house when I was a teenager because I got to watch all the operas for free. <laughs> a part of my uh, journey of reconnecting with my Italian family was I got involved with um, going to the opera uh -huh. in La when I was still in Los Angeles, of course, the opera going community skews very much older. Yes. 
But I just found the whole production and ritual of it as, even though it seemed, you know, even then it seemed quite anachronistic, a thing to be doing, mm-hmm. you know, going to watch sort of heavy people strut around a stage speaking a language that most people in the audience couldn't speak. Mm-hmm. And yet you, and yet it generated emotion, real, very strong emotion in a person to, to watch it. And it yeah. was very strange to me. I mean, you know, I, even before I understood the Italian, mm-hmm. I was crying during La Boheme and I could oh, not explain that was why. Heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. it's a heartbreaking opera. Oh, man, oh. that's so fascinating how it was, you know, opera that led you to reconnect in that way. Because I was curious. I was like, why specifically, you know, your your maternal grandfather's, you know, hometown in Italy, you know? Um, but I'm guessing you might have another reason for that. Well, uh, my mother's all Italian. She's uh, father's from Luca and her mother's from Calabria, which are <laughs> practically different countries. But um, they met in the U.S. and married uh, but um, I I had been taken to see my relatives in Luca uh, when I was about six or seven. Um, I found it fascinating. My mother actually found it upsetting um, because she couldn't speak any Italian and, and she felt her father had died recently and she felt it made her sad. Right. And she didn't really want to go back. Um, and I didn't go back until I was uh, uh, married and, uh, you know, had some money in the bank to take myself. Mm-hmm. And we went for the first time in 2001. Uh, and 9-11 happened while we were there, which was interesting. Um, and at the beginning of our trip, too. But uh, I got such a warm reception. Uh, that I went back the next year. And when we went, we would go for a month or more, um, Mm -hmm. sometimes two months, and rent an apartment or rent a small house. Or uh, once we stayed in a cousin's house because they were out of the the country. And we'd go to a lot of family dinners. And we've been there for Christmas. And we've been there for funerals. And we've been there you know, for different events. And I think I'm invited to a wedding this spring. Aww. And, um, you know, in the process, I knew a little Italian going in, but uh, learned a lot more painfully because it, it's not really a skill I have, but I'm operational now. And, um, and uh, it became the part, the time of, of the year when I, I had plenty of time to take photographs as opposed to when I was working at my illustration work. And so I would come home with thousands of photographs, you know, uh, mm-hmm. digital photographs that I could use for reference. And that was really the inception of it. So the beginning of it was a family thing, but the end result was it sort of became my self-assigned um, artistic subject. Interesting. Uh, and it's nice because it's it's both to me it's both familiar but not familiar, and so I'm getting to paint things that I would have trouble finding in the United States. Um, people dress differently, people hold themselves differently. Um, the the backgrounds, the buildings are obviously in some state of decay, which I like mm-hmm. anyway. Um, and it sort of has that. It's kind of like an opera set. You know, yep. in, but in real life. <laughs> yeah. And so I found all those things attractive. I could have just as easily stumbled into something else, but that's what I, I stumbled into. I love that. You know, it's like, you know, you just go with the flow of life and, and see the sights and respond to them and they stick with you. You know, it's, uh, that's how it is. <laughs> yeah. And things just happen to you. Yeah. Um, I sort of avoided doing kind of postcard views. Mm-hmm. Uh, not Luca has, has not been a big tourist destination until fairly recently, and it doesn't really have too many iconic 
things that you would say this this represents Luca. I mean, there's no Leaning Tower of Pisa, and there's no Uffizi, and there's no Statue of David, and it's it's just a it's a very peaceful walled city with some churches in it, and and um, and when I was a kid, it was a very dirty, post-war, run-down, uh, stressed-out place. Now it's become kind of a center in Europe. It hosts the European Comic Con. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. There's something that happens in Lucca, and I remember it was oh, important. It's, yeah, it's huge. It's huge. So everybody comes with their cosplay stuff. Yeah, and it's crazy. I avoid being there at the time, <laughs> but it, but it but it's also a very much a music venue, and that sort of started because Puccini is from Lucca. And there's an opera, and there's an opera house there, and it had a tradition of training foreign opera singers to sing in Italian. It was kind of a mini industry oh. there yeah. uh, to teach Italian to opera singers. Right. Um, so you would you would be walking through the country, and you would hear someone singing opera out of a window, you know, and they were just studying or practicing. But as since they've since transformed themselves into a real music venue mm-hmm. where they, they host, you know, they'll host Clapton or uh, Knopfler. And last time we were there, they had the Rolling Stones and they set up a stage outside the city walls. And most of the people in town were not Lucchese. You know, they were, yeah. most of them were British visitors, <clears throat> which, and the and Luca getting popular like this has kind of spoiled it for oh. me as a subject. Unfortunately, it it oh. had to go its own way. But the truth is, to go there now and take pictures. If I take a picture of someone on the street, they're probably not Luca. From Luca, they're, yeah. Unless I'm there in the dead of winter, they're probably not Italian. Um, which is okay. Yeah. But uh, if I want, so now if I want sort of small town life, I have to go somewhere else. And but and Calabria is like that. You don't, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Wow. Yeah, that's but so Luca's. Cool, I love Luca, but it's kind of lost to me. Uh, you know. Yeah, you know, I I'm sure they were trying to. You know, I mean, it's hard for a, a small town like Luca to compete with, you know, like Florence, which is nearby, or even Cinque Terre, which is also nearby, and then <laughs> Rome or you know Pisa. Well, we, I think it was a change in. In government management, um, for mm-hmm. a long time, they actually had a policy of uh, restricting the number of hotel rooms and restricting the parking because they did not want people to stay overnight. Right. It was okay for them to come in and take on a bus and then leave, but the, but the Lucchese did not want to be a tourist town for the longest time. Right. Um, but you know, those people, those naysayers, got older and died and. And the younger people said, "No, we want Luca to be a happening place." And th- th- they got they got the government that wanted to do that, and now it's transformed. Yeah. And now there's I mean, parking I'm... everywhere, and there's <laughs> a lot of hotels, and yeah, oh. it's just different. It is. It's different. Yeah. I mean, there's there's all always you know a, a downside to you know tourism. Um, there's a good side and a downside, right? The good side is, you know, the town is booming and, and they have, you know, they can continue to live there because there's so many empty towns now, you know, uh, in, in Italy, because there's so many people leaving the small towns to go to the big cities. So, you know, those little towns have to survive somehow. So they have to bring tourism, um, or, you know, die out completely. So it, it's become a strange, <laughs> a strange landscape these days of negative yeah, birth rates. Okay. Uh, that's become the case in the uh, Garfagnana uh, near Luca, which is sort of the mm. mountain, little hill towns up there. A lot of them would be abandoned, except for the pl- fact that uh, foreigners had bought them as vacation homes. Right. So now you go to them, and you, they're, they're almost abandoned because at any given time, there's almost no one there. But everything mm. is in perfect repair because, you know, the Dutch or the English or whoever owns them keeps them in good right. repair. So, so the buildings are preserved, but the culture is gone. Makes interesting. it interesting. Yeah. yeah, I wonder. I wonder where that will, how that will end up in the next twenty, fifty years. Um, I don't know. Things I are guess changing. We'll just have to see. Also, you know, a lot of my paintings are people 
uh, working in Lucca, and the mm-hmm. tradition in a small Italian town or small city was yeah. that there would be individual stores for a very narrow range of products. You know, like one of my popular series of paintings was a man that I met, and his entire store was chicken products. All he sold were parts of chickens, chickens and eggs, and nothing else. And next door, the guy sold fish and octopus and nothing else. And, you know, on the other side of town, there were women who made fresh pasta every day and nothing else. But now all those places are going away, the owners are retiring, and they're being replaced by mini marts. Right. And that, you know, the stuff comes in on mini trucks through the narrow streets mm-hmm. every day and the store gets reloaded and and but all those all those old things are, are going away. At least in Luca. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they still exist in other places. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, that's the interesting thing about industry. Uh sometimes it's you know, it makes everything easier, more accessible, but at the same time the artisanal side of it languishes quite a bit. You know, there's and I think that's also where I'm hoping, because, you know, of course, there's AI art right now. Um, and I'm hoping that because of all of these things that have become so automated and so industrious, I guess, it might highlight also the importance of, you know, things that are handmade, you know, the artisanal craftsmanship of things. Because I'm also seeing that even in, in Comic-Con, right, and like conventions of, of like all these comics and anime and stuff, there's actually been an uptick in people who prefer oil painted stuff than oh. uh, the graphics. Yeah, I've interviewed a couple of people who, you know, they've made a comfortable living selling prints of their oil paintings or even their originals. Um, so you never know. Maybe the tides turn. <laughs> well, I, I, I do kind of think that there's going to be a human reaction where just because we're human, we kind of place an extra value on things that are handmade and that <laughs> AI doesn't really press that button successfully. Yeah. You know, it might be a successful image, but when people know it's AI, and yeah. you can already kind of see that on, even on internet reactions, people say, yeah, but that's AI, as if that means it's not something I value very much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If a person had did that, had done that image, I'd be impressed. But AI yeah. did it, well, I'm not impressed at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you might think that would extend to the purchase of, of original art too, whereas mm-hmm. yes, I could have a photograph, I could have a photoshopped image to take the wall, take up that, that wall space but I have a thing that a human being actually had to spend time making. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, and I think frankly, part of that is the buyer, they're buying a luxury item, you know, for decoration. Mm-hmm. Part of it is, you know, if they're an affluent person, say, part of the status is a person had to put in a lot of hours to make that. And I can afford to pay him for those hours. And that's why it's on my wall. And that's why visitors to my home should be impressed. They would not be impressed if I just printed out an AI image. That would not be impressive or interesting. Yeah, I agree. I mean, some people, maybe they, they like AI art enough to do that, and that's fine. But as anything is with anything, any corner of art, there's always someone who prefers, you know, handmade um, and will pay top dollar. I mean, if there are people out there who pay top dollar for a fine pair of shoes, right, that are handmade, or a fine purse, or a fine dress, I'm sure there's someone out there who will definitely want to hang a beautiful handmade painting on their wall. Yeah, I just can't <laughs> predict, you know, what the what the um, draw what the line in the sand is. Yeah. You could also the another analogy could be uh, handmade furniture. Uh, uh-huh. If people were very would be very impressed if you could say, well, that chair was handmade. Uh, the guy who made it used only hand tools and he cut all those mortises and tendons. I know this because frame making. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
it took them a long time and it's beautiful. And look, you can see where that has tool marks on it from hand tools. And some people will go, oh, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> but from a com consumer point of view is, do I care enough to pay four times as much for that person who have made it with hand tools as opposed to it being made with machines? Right. Yeah. Because it's kind, it's kind of, they both are chairs and mm -hmm, they look mm -hmm. about the same. Yeah. Yeah. It depends if the person has a utilitarian perspective about buying things. <laughs> you know, like, I just need a chair to sit on versus a person who wants, you know, something refined and, and maybe expresses themselves through how they decorate. Then, I, I mean, I would be inclined to buy a handmade chair, personally, if I could And I it. would, too, <laughs> if I could afford it. <laughs> but if go. I couldn't afford it, I would still need a chair. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Um, that is how it is. <laughs> and the values of younger generations are not necessarily going to be mine. I'm, I'm sure they're not going to be. Um, Never know. These new generations are... Oh, you're um, one of them. Oh, oh no. I feel like I'm a 60-year-old trapped in the body of a younger person. Trust mm -hmm. me. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, I don't know. We'll see how it turns out. I mean, I'm personally the type of, of artist who also wants to collect beautiful work by painters that I admire. So, it, you know, I wouldn't mind doing like swaps, for example, with with mm -hmm. friends um, I do and that. actually hang them. See, that's that's the wonderful part, too. I do that, you know, especially when I contemplate uh, my mortality. Um, I know that whatever's left in my house when I die is probably most of it will have to be thrown away. There's just so much of it. And so I'm very pleased if I can get a relative of a friend, a friend to accept a gift. Because <laughs> I think there's another message in a bottle. Maybe it'll survive 100 years before someone throws it out or it burns down in a house. Uh, yeah. And I, at this point, I have artwork all over the world and all, all over the country. And uh, some of it will survive. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know if you know about the, the Leighton painting. Uh, what's it called? Flaming June. Uh, it was actually found by someone at a thrift store, like a, a flea market. They found it. Oh. They bought it for the price of the frame. And now it's in a museum because it's obviously it's it's Lord Leighton, like, yeah. <laughs> for Christ's sake, big name. Um, so you never know. You never yeah. know. Yeah. And of course, that that runs in fashions too. You yeah. Know, as we all know, Sargent was incredibly popular during his lifetime, and then he really wasn't, and then he was again. Yeah. Same with Rembrandt. Yeah. And Vermeer, pretty much forgotten, until a critic historian decided he was being neglected and forced his rediscovery. Yeah. So, oh. And and and. What I didn't realize is that um, the Mona Lisa, the most famous painting in the world, mm -hmm. nobody knew about it, really, ex mm -hmm. until it was stolen in the yeah. 20th century. <laughs> no one cared. And the story about recovering it was so intriguing to people, it made the painting famous. Mm -hmm. You could objectively say, it's, it's a great painting. It's not that great. It's, oh. <laughs> there's plenty it's the of Renaissance <laughs> it's yeah it's the story that goes with it yeah same same yeah. with van gogh you know he's an industry but it's the story that makes i mean obviously it's pretty unique and remarkable work yeah but the reason we know about him is because his brother's widow made it her life's work to uh you know get his paintings out there and be famous otherwise he'd be gone we wouldn't know about him yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, the, the the hands of unseen people of the future who, you know, continue those legacies. You you can't it's it's out of everyone's control. It's fascinating. And there's no point worrying about it because you'll be dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It won't back to and the even existentialism. If, <laughs> and and even if you are in an afterlife anymore, the last thing you're gonna care about is whether people will appreciate the pains you made while you were alive. Not gonna yeah. matter. <laughs> yeah. Not in anybody's cosmology does it matter that you're not treated better in heaven because people like your paintings. It doesn't I don't think it works that way. <laughs> yeah. 
it's you know it is it is what it is <laughs> oh man oh james oh that was it's very fascinating to talk to you um do you by any chance have any upcoming you know shows projects anything that you want to mention uh i have i don't um I'm still in three galleries and people can learn about that on my website and they can, you know, get the address to my uh, social media and YouTube. And I nag jamescrandall.com early on. So that's my domain name. That's easy to remember, I hope. Um, I'm sending a, a painting to the uh, Oil Paintings of America National that I'm pretty happy with. I'm a little embarrassed that I made it so big because it's going to be a pain to ship, but uh, I'm going to put a floater frame on it so it will fit in the box, the biggest box that FedEx will take. So there's that. and I, um, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm like a lot of people, I'm still recovering from the COVID and in my case, yeah. my health issues to figure out what my place in the world is. Uh, and uh, just sort of getting back up to speed. If anything, I'm trying to be braver about mm -hmm. my art. I'm trying to do things with less thought about people, whether people will like them or not. Yes, that's a great idea. Because I, I, I don't want to die never having really done just exactly what I wanted. Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I commend you for that, yes. I wish I had done it sooner. Yeah, I, you know, I wish I. But it's better I, but that was, you're doing it now. Uh, I was a coward. I admit it. <laughs> oh. Well, you're not. You're not a coward anymore. You got this. <laughs> yeah. These last few years. <clears throat> well, thank you, James, for the very fascinating conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you, Laura. It's been very nice talking with you yeah. before and during. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs>